Welcome to the ultimate leveling guide for the Lord of the Rings Online, which is a game that really does put the massive and massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Lotro for short has a level cap of 140, which is a lot of levels, and there is also tons of content in the game and really just tons of features with tons of things to do while leveling. So it can take quite a while and it is a process. So with that, this mega guide is thematically long, so settle in and let's get leveling. So for many players, Lotro is a game about the journey, as in it is essentially about the leveling and questing experience rather than rushing to endgame like the focus of some other MMOs. That said, for players that prefer to do so, there are definitely some efficient ways to level and get to end game content relatively quickly, at least relative for a game with 140 levels. So we'll be covering all of that in this guide and I'll even be sharing some of my preferred leveling routes. As with any MMO, Clash Choice is very important to your experience playing Lotro. And I have a few other videos that I will actually defer you to if you're really unsure about your Clash Choice, but for this one, what I will say is that every class is capable of soloing all solo and story content in the game, and often every class can actually solo some group content depending on your gear and your skill level. For leveling, I must say that the Hunter and Warden are two classes that stand out and they are great classes to consider. The Hunter is much more beginner friendly and it is a very fast and convenient class because they can easily travel around Middle Earth with ports. And then the Warden is a not very beginner friendly type class, but it also does have great travel and some great AoE damage and survivability to go along with it. All of the other classes in the game are not bad though, and in some situations they may even be better, as discussed in this video if you want to learn more about that. But again, ultimately all classes can level with ease while solo. Now to actually level up in Lotro, there are quite a few ways you can level, and there are also a few different activities in game that give XP. But there are going to be some important things to keep in mind while leveling in Lotro with character progression systems because those are important. So early in this guide, we should cover some notes I have on progression. The number one note is on clash trait points. I'll link a video going over all of these in the description, but they are perhaps the most important thing for you to build your character out. And not all trait points are gotten just from leveling. Instead, quite a few of these trait points involve class quests, and in some cases zone quests, and even book quests, especially at the higher levels. We'll get to the full list of where these come from later, but for class traits, that system will start at level 6, where you can open the trait panel with J key by default, and spec into a specialization. Class specs in Lotro are usually referred to by their color, the red, blue, and yellow line, just for reference. So the second note for progression is Virtue XP. Virtue experience is how you level up Virtue traits. Virtue traits are traits that give your character a stat boost and they each have a primary stat, a secondary stat, and a tertiary stat. Various in-game activities will give you this Virtue XP, but the primary source is going to be through deeds within each zone in the game. Now deeds is a whole system in Lotro that is sort of like an achievement or expanded quest system. These deeds typically involve, for Virtue XP at least, involve slaying a large number of certain enemies in the zone, exploring a few key locations in the zone, and finally doing a large number of quests in the zone. Virtue XP deeds are a good thing to try to fit into your leveling experience if you wish to boost your virtues, which give your character very valuable stats, and they do become important in endgame content. So, a common strategy is to quest through a zone at least enough to finish the quest deed, and then the exploration deed should be easy after that, and if you wish to spend more time there, you can do the Slayer deeds. An important note though is to be sure to select an earning virtue that will use any of the virtue XP you get. If you do not select a virtue, all of the virtue XP that you get goes to the first virtue available just in the list, which is charity, and that typically is not going to be a great one. So eventually you will be able to slot 5 virtue traits, and the virtues you want to level will depend on your character, class, spec, and what you want your build to be. For a starting point for a fresh leveling character, loyalty is going to be the most universally useful virtue for everybody. So I personally always select that one first on 
all of my characters. If you're interested in more details on which virtues are best to choose, check out my guide on just that. The third note I have is on your legendary items. While the revamped LI system has them function kind of like gear where you replace components of your LIs as you level up, you will still need to go through the level 50 Walls of Moria quest to acquire your legendary items for the first time on a character. Legendary items while leveling after that is something I honestly wouldn't worry too much about because the tracery item, that is what you slot into your LI, those will quickly be replaced while leveling especially after level 85. So really the most important part of the new LI system as you level is to make sure you reforge them every five levels starting at level 56 after the initial reforge when you acquire them for the first time. And the benefit of this is it will make your primary affix, such as the DPS or tactical damage, it will make those scale with your level. I'll have a bit more info on the legendary items and clash trait points for that matter later after we get some more context from leveling up, so stay tuned for that. The fourth note on progression is on gate opening. Some areas in the game will require you to go through book quests to gain access to some places. And also some book quests will unlock skirmishes, which are an instance or kind of like a dungeon, but not quite a dungeon in the game. An example is going to be Mirkwood, which as a whole, Mirkwood requires you to go through the Mirkwood intro quest to access the zone, and Mirkwood's book quests also have skirmishes unlocked with them. Finally, some group instances will also require you to discover the entrances before you can run them. This is a bit of an inconsistent requirement in the game, but may be something to keep in mind if you see a new instance on the instance panel and you can't run it due to needing the discovery. This especially becomes true later in the game at higher levels and in newer instances. The final progression note is going to be on reputation, which is another thing you really do want to keep in mind while leveling. It is something that's not going to usually be too big of a deal, but reputation barterers will often have things like gear, crafting recipes, which is especially true at higher levels. They will also have travel skills, which can be very convenient, and they have tons and tons of cosmetics, which a lot of people like. Oftentimes, they will also have mounts and things like that. So reputation factions are generally associated with each zone or a broader region as you level through the game, so it can be at least worthwhile to check out what they offer and see if it is something you want to work your reputation up to barter for anything specific. Finally, reputation factions have deeds associated with them that can be a great way to earn Lotro points fairly easily. If you're wondering how to get reputation, quests and tasks in the associated region will be your best bet, but some reputation factions also have consumable items that drop from relevant mobs. Next up, we should talk about crafting. I often get the question of if crafting is worth doing while leveling. And overall, I do think crafting can be good to keep up with while leveling, but it is also not necessary if you are just not interested in it. The great benefit of crafting, though, is that you can make yourself gear including armor, jewelry, weapons, or you can even make yourself consumables to be used in combat. In Lotro, the crafting system starts with your vocation, of which you can choose just a single vocation on your character. Now, each vocation will come with three crafting professions. Usually, two of these professions are going to be synergistic towards each other, as in one will gather materials that the second one will craft with, and then you'll just have an extra crafting profession to go along with those two. Now, the vocation that I would recommend actually depends on your class and really just what you want to do with crafting. It really comes down to a personal preference. But generally, nowadays, I will say for usefulness, the crafting professions that make armor, such as tailor and metalsmith, or even jeweler, those will have good general use for you as you level up. Professions that make weapons, such as woodworker and weaponsmith, are actually very useful up until you get your legendary items because those become your weapons, essentially, and that will be around level 50. At that point, weapon crafting becomes much less useful and by many player accounts, much more boring and pointless. That said, they still do have some uses past level 50 if you're really interested in that. 
So outside of those types of professions, you could also choose to become a cook to give yourself food that gives useful buffs, or of course you could feed your kinship with that. You could also become a scholar, which can craft dyes for cosmetic armor and other consumables that are actually useful in combat, including things like potions and buffing scrolls. Now, if you are curious, typically the best armor below level 50 is actually going to be from crafting. Now, from level 50 to 100, after that, crafted armor is pretty good, but some of the better crafting recipes are locked behind the guild crafting system or reputation barters. After level 100, good recipes will mostly come from reputation or occasionally there are guild crafting recipes mixed in. It becomes a little bit inconsistent at the higher levels. So with all that, being able to make your own armor while you level is always nice. One other thing I just mentioned is guild crafting, and if you are not familiar with that, that is something that is also good to keep up with while leveling if you do choose to craft on your character. The guild crafting is kind of like a reputation system for your crafting profession. To earn reputation, you must complete time-gated crafting recipes that have things like a day, three day, or one week cooldown, so it can sometimes feel like a chore, but it is ultimately going to be useful to keep up because there are some great recipes from the crafting guilds, especially for professions that make armor and jewelry. And finally, I have not yet talked about gathering, which is honestly my personal favorite part of crafting and something I just love to do while leveling. The main two gathering professions are forester and prospector. One gathers logs for woodworkers, the other gathers ore for a few professions actually. Technically scholars do also have their own gathering nodes, typically they're going to be located in enemy camps and ruins. Now for the two main gathering professions, the explorer vocation is the only one that gets both of them, making it the best option if you just like gathering materials. Now with gathering materials, you can choose to sell them or you can use them, ship them off to an alt to use while you are leveling. And explorer also comes with tailor, which is great for light or medium armor classes to make their own gear. So it is a popular choice. And I realize this section was long, but that's the reality of this guide, and hopefully that is helpful to get you started on how you want to approach crafting while leveling in Lotro. And now we are ready to cover more on actually leveling in Lotro. So, while leveling, something too important to keep in mind is the pace of progression. Typically, if you do every single quest in a zone as you will level, you will start out leveling and outpacing the quests and zones in the game. Over leveling can honestly be a bit of a problem for some people in the game, but also does mean that there is a relatively fast leveling pace in Lotro, even though there are 140 total levels. One way to combat and counteract over leveling is to get an XP disabler in the Lotro store for 95 Lotro points. This will take up your pocket item slot and you can equip and unequip it as necessary to stay on level with quests, especially if you do lean towards the completionist style. On the other hand, this does also mean that if you don't care too much for a particular level range or set of zones or anything like that, you can often quickly level up and get to the next area. It also means that thoroughly completing every zone and like every quest in the zone and every side quest is not really necessary in Lotro. So to smooth out progression in Lotro, there are a few different ways you can level, but typically it will boil down to quests, missions, dungeons, skirmishes, or even festivals, at least while they're active. So to get to those, the main method for players, most players at least, is going to be good old questing. For starters, the book quests are generally a decent guide for where to go, but they sometimes take you all over the place and they can be quite long to play through. So if you're maybe playing an alt or just not as interested in those, it may be good to know what is safe to skip in the game and what is more important for long-term character progression. Book quests will tend to become a bit more necessary at higher levels, but outside of book quests, zone quests aren't typically required for anything, but doing zone quests can provide many benefits besides just like character XP to level up, and there are some important zones with important zone quests to note that we'll get to later. Like many MMOs without level scaling though, there are going to be important notes for quest level, and these level notes apply also to enemies, not just quests, and enemies also known as mobs. 
So quests below your level by nine or more will be gray. Gray quests offer very little XP, and if they are regular solo quests, they will give you very little challenge. For leveling speed, these usually aren't worth doing unless you're interested in other benefits such as deeds, cosmetics, reputations, etc., or just having fun completing those. Finally, for most regular quests in Lotro, you can start them up to five levels below the quest level. So it is possible to start zones before their actual level range, and of course you can quest in a zone that is below your level on the opposite end of the spectrum. Landscape and questing content in Lotro is typically easy enough that being underleveled isn't much of a problem, but I should mention that mobs 5 levels above you have a pretty high deflect chance, which basically means that mobs have a high chance to completely negate damage and effects, so it can sometimes be difficult to kill mobs 5 plus levels above you. Usually, if I personally quest underleveled, I try to be at most 4 levels below the quest level. So with that in mind, we can move on from questing and move on to some other methods of leveling, and we'll cover missions, which are actually technically quests. These are short solo slash duo instances that usually are the length of one or two regular quests, and they are repeatable daily. Assuming you own the necessary quest pack or expansion, missions can be run starting at level 20 and scaled to your character's level. They were added originally in the War of Three Peaks, which has a rotating set of missions each day, and then there were some added to the Wildwood area in Northwest Bree, and that has a set of 10 missions. Blood of Azog, also known as Erebor as far as missions go, has a set of 10 missions, and finally Gundabad has a daily rotating set of missions. There are also further adventures missions which you must purchase on their own or if you are a VIP subscriber you will get them included in the subscription. But those are essentially a set of missions that follow a specific storyline and just like regular missions are repeatable and the such. So each mission's faction in the game has their own currency and reputation system and some unique rewards, including somewhat decent at best gear, it's really not the greatest, and they do offer a selection of cosmetics if you are curious on the benefit of missions. Now, missions also typically have their own deeds and can give virtue XP, and even the rewards for completing the repeatable quests with missions can also be valuable. So missions can be a method for primary leveling, but it honestly likely get monotonous really quick. What I find missions great for is for pushing your character a level to maybe a few levels even, up to fill maybe like a level gap and skip a zone you don't like. Additionally, some mission rewards, uh, like Motes of Enchantment, which is one of Lotro's many, many currencies, but Motes of Enchantment is a universal currency that you can barter for a chest that will give you level appropriate gear. Motes of Enchantment are the version of currency that is for below the level cap and again rewarded from missions, whereas Embers of Enchantment are for the current level cap or more accurately or precisely for level 131 to 140 in Gundabad at the time of this video. The next leveling method we have is dungeons, or often simply just called instances in Lotro. Dungeons can actually be great for XP and leveling fast in the game, but a problem you may run into is it can be a real challenge to find an on-level group to run instances with while you level. The best method I have found to run all the dungeons as you unlock them is to join a kinship, which is Lotro's version of a guild and or find a group of like-minded players to have a consistent group to run the instances with while you unlock them. Now instances are a bit complex in that most of them are now scalable by level once you unlock them, so you can set the level of the instance, but some instances also do not have that feature. Notably, the level 50 instances in Angmar, the Mori instances, and the Rise of Isengard instances are non-scaling. The other reason I do bring up instances here is because they are basically the method for power leveling or speed leveling. Certain dungeons such as the, for example, the Wraith of Water Wing of Fornost, Great Barrow Sambrog Wing, and then at higher level School and Library at the Amirdine, and Sword Halls are all great examples of instances for power leveling with a higher level character or even just like quick leveling with an on-level group. This is something that you can just keep in mind as an 
option in the game for leveling, but as I mentioned in the beginning, I recommend at least starting off the game looking more towards the enjoying the journey type playstyle, and then maybe with alts consider some faster options like dungeons, but also keep in mind you might miss out on some important character progression systems if you just level by dungeons. And finally, when we get to the zones list, I will point out the instances and instance clusters once we go through that. For starters though, the first dungeon you unlock will be Great Barrow, which unlocks at level 20. Moving on, we have Skirmishes, which are an instance type that were added to the game in the Siege of Mirkwood expansion. The Skirmish system is a bit outdated and hasn't been updated for quite a few years, but they are repeatable instances that honestly still give good XP. And that's partially because there are plenty of mobs to kill and also because the final XP reward for completing them is decent as well. So after doing the skirmishes intro, which becomes available at level 20, you should get a notification for that. After that, you will unlock an assortment of offensive and defensive skirmishes that you can scale the group size, difficulty, and level to your liking. However, if leveling solo, running a couple levels above you at the lowest difficulty tends to be the most efficient. I find skirmishes are best if used as a filler, kind of like missions, but pending a future update, the downside of skirmishes is the rewards are basically nothing compared to missions, and all you consistently get out of it is some fun and character XP. While we are covering instances, I suppose I should mention epic battles. Now, despite being introduced to the game in Helm's Deep at the level 95 cap, these become available at level 10, and to an extent you can actually scale the group size even. So in these epic battles, also ones called big battles, your character scales to level 100, either scaling up if you are actually below that level, or down if you are above. As a note, scaling does not work well in Lotro, so low-level characters are somewhere around very to extremely weak, whereas over-leveled characters are very strong. Running epic battles below level 50 and before you get your ally would be especially rough without a group to basically carry you, so keep that in mind if you do try an epic battle that seems impossible to run. But anyway, what do epic battles offer you? Well, they do give you a bit of XP, but they are really relatively slow and inefficient for just leveling. But they eventually also grant you two clash trait points, but these are some of the slowest trait points to acquire in the game because you have to run many epic battles with varying group sizes to actually get these two trait points. Again, I'll have more info on these trait points later in its section, but outside of the trait points and little bits of XP, epic battles do admittedly give some pretty nice jewelry for your character's level and occasionally some level 100 jewelry because why not? So just to note, past level 100, this jewelry isn't really that good, and at that point it is quite rare to even actually get a piece. So depending on the character and how I am feeling, I usually don't actually run epic battles on them, and I try to ignore that system, but I do keep in mind on some characters that I might want those two trait points. But moving away from instances, we have the final method for leveling finally, which is festivals. Now, festivals in Lotro don't have 100% uptime. The official events calendar, which unfortunately is not provided in game, will cover the dates for these. You can find it on the Lotro forums, by the way. But when you actually do have festivals active, you can complete the repeatable quest to get quite a bit of XP and level decently fast even. You can do all that while earning yourself some nice cosmetics to show off. And just like with all of the other alternative methods for XP gain, I use festivals as exactly that, an alternative. That's exactly why I actually call them alternatives if you could not guess. So that aside, those are going to be all of the non-regular questing options for leveling in Lotro. For a short summary, I often prefer missions for filling in level gaps and completing some convenient deeds for Virtue XP in the meantime, as well as they do offer nice rewards from the weekly wrapper quest to complete so many missions. Otherwise, I love running dungeons while leveling in Lotro, provided I can actually find a group which for the past couple years has basically been relying on my kinship, also Lotro's version of a guild, for that. And frequently, I will use dungeons for speed leveling, but that is typically reserved for like specific alts if I want them to get to a specific level fast for a specific reason. Otherwise, questing is going to be the main method for leveling for me.
So now that we have some context for leveling up in Lotro, I should point out that server choice can actually be important in the game. Besides the EU and NA server split, there are also legendary servers. These are the important ones to point out. But I will say that all servers are physically going to be located in the Northeast US, and choosing between an NA and EU server is more about when players will be most active and what the peak times are for that server. But for all these normal servers, server choice doesn't matter too much, and it will come down to more tier preferences on populations, player run events, and roleplay. Legendary servers, though, these add an extra dynamic because these are servers that limit the level cap and content that you have access to in the game based on previous level caps that the game has historically had, like with previous expansion releases. This functions kind of like a progression server where the level cap and available content increases every few weeks to months, eventually catching up to the content normal servers have. You may wonder why a non-classic server like this even exists. Well, they are mainly popular for running lower level endgame content such as the non-scaling Ingmar Moria and Rise of Isengard instances. They also will help concentrate the population towards a smaller level range and at least early into the legendary server's life cycle. So if this does sound like something that interests you, you might want to choose a legendary server, but I will point out they typically have low population after the first few months, but they can still be decent to do these lower level group activities. One perhaps downside for some people is they do require the VIP subscription to play on. And at the time of this video, the original legendary server Anor just got shut down while Shadowfax is progressing through Rohan and Treebeard is right around Mirkwood. But besides these lower level caps on the legendary servers, at least to start out, how else do servers really factor into leveling? For the legendary servers, they actually have different character XP rates that function as permanent effects that cannot be turned off or changed. So on an ore, you only got 60% of normal XP, so it did take a little bit longer to level up, and this actually helped curb some issues of over leveling. On Treebeard, you get a minuscule 40% of normal XP, that's less than half, and yeah, it does indeed take over twice as much XP to level up. This really does help with over-leveling issues, but it might actually make leveling a bit on the slow side for some players, especially if you are leveling alts. Now, the third legendary server, Shadowfax, as the name implies, is a speedy server where you gain 50% more XP than normal. This lets you level fast, to say the least. So legendary servers do have other benefits, such as some exclusive titles and character portraits, and Shadowfax actually gives you a plus 20% virtue experience bonus, which can be quite nice. And finally, Treebeard and Shadowfax at the time of this video are the only servers that boast the landscape difficulty scaling feature where you can actually make the landscape content more challenging by debuffing your character. This feature, the whole reason you'd want to do this besides fun, is going to be it has some exclusive titles, slightly increased virtue XP gain, and a slightly increased character XP gain as well. For some players, this will make leveling more interesting because combat is more engaging as it's more difficult and it takes a little bit longer to kill mobs so you can get the feel of more of your abilities in combat. Now, I may not recommend this feature for a first-time player, but it can be interesting if you want a more difficult and slower-paced Lotro, just something to keep in mind. So finally, do I recommend legendary servers for a pure leveling experience? Probably not, unless the features of what, like whatever legendary server it is are very appealing to you. If you play the game frequently, it can actually be easy to run into the level cap and then be limited on the content you can run, whereas you would otherwise be free to continue leveling through all the content in the game on a normal server. Alright, with all of that out of the way, we're finally ready to level up. I do want to point out that unfortunately with Lotro, some of the most popular resources for the level ranges of these zones are inaccurate in some areas. So with this list, I hope to have an accurate and up-to-date reference for the level range of zones. A way you can at least partially verify information that you come across without actually going like in-game to actually check all the zones individually is you can look at the Lotro Wiki zone and in particular the list of quests in the zone to get the best idea of the actual level range of each zone, assuming that the Lotro Wiki is actually going to be fully up-to-date as well. 
Now, let's get to studying maps for the zones by level section of this guide. So to start off, we are looking at the most zoomed out version of the Lotro map, and we can see five primary regions that are in the game, with Iriador being mostly for lower levels, Rovanian including some mid and high level content, Rohan's mostly mid level content, and Gondor is getting kind of between mid and high level to high level content, and finally Mordor's just a bunch of high level content for the most part. Now before we get to the actual zones by level, let's go ahead and do just the level ranges of the region. So for Iriador, this is going to include level 1 to 50 content, then it is going to have some content that is 60 to 75. After that in Rovanian, there's some level 50 to 60 content with Moria, and then there's some 60 to 65 content in the south. Next up, we have Rohan, which is going to include some level 70 content way up at the top and go all the way to 95 in the west. And then down at Gondor, that will be level 95 to 105. And then if we zoom back out and go to Mordor, this will be level 105 to 115 as well as 120 to 130. Zooming back out, we have to go up to Rovanian, and this will also include some level 115 to 140 content. And currently, the level cap is 140 at the time of recording this video, at least. So that is the overview of the broad regions in the map, but let's go ahead and start looking at more specific zones and their level ranges. Now, I do want to point out, once you get out of the introduction, you will be placed in your race's starting area and zone. And by the way, you can actually travel between these as any race and class combination, so you're not confined to your starting area. Also, for each starting area, they will have their own prologue, which, as the name implies, is going to be the lead up to the formal epic quest in Volume 1, Book 1, which is where the formal epic quests start. So for the three starter zones, we will go from west to east, but we have Era of the Wind as one of them, the Shire is the next one, and Breland is also going to be one of the starter zones. So to cover Ear of the Wind, which is going to be the starter zone for elves and dwarves, but again, anybody can travel here. Elves would be the southern side, dwarves would be the northern side. Ear of the Wind is going to be level 5 to 14 quests. And then zooming out, we will go to the Shire, which is level 5 to 12, but there is actually a single level 13 quest. So it is actually lower level than Ear of the Wind technically. And I suppose now is as good of time as any to point out that level ranges aren't really normalized in Lotro. And as I've covered plenty of times, just as a reminder, you don't have to quest in a zone in the level range. You can and often will stay in the Shire longer if you quest through the entire zone. It's not like as soon as you reach level 12 or 13, you just have to leave the zone, just to point that out. But moving on after Era of the Wind and the Shire, the other Shire, by the way, is for Hobbits. But for Breland, the next starter zone, that is going to be for the Race of Man. And the Breland is actually a really large zone, but where you start as a starter Race of Man is going to be an Arch Hit. Now, Arch Hit, Combe, and the eastern side here, including Chetwood and Midgewater Marshes, all of that content is going to be 5 to 14, and that's what's considered the starter area of Breland. And then there's the sort of main chunk of the zone is how I'd consider it as the rest of the zone, which is basically the zone after your intro area, and that's where you start Volume 1, Book 1 in the game. For Volume 1, Book 1, if you don't know where to get started on that, even though the prologue, I believe, should leave you there, that would be in the Prancing Pony Inn and Bree, which is the main city and the mainest of main cities in Lotro right now. But for the rest of Bree, there's a lot going on here. There's going to be, as I mentioned, the main chunk. That is all level 14 to 21. And the epic quest there will be level 15 to 21 to mostly match that level range. Now, I also do want to point out there are two instances in Breedland. There's going to be in the Southern Barrow Downs. There's Northern Barrow Downs and Southern Barrow Downs. In the Southern Barrow Downs, there is the Great Barrow, which is the first regular dungeon you unlock in Lotro, and that's going to be level 20 plus it can scale. And similarly, more recently added is Woe of the Willow, which is technically in the Old Forest, but we can't see it on the map. That one is also level 20 plus three man instance that you unlock at level 20. Another area you might notice in Breland is the Wildwood, which is level 45, but we'll get to that later because that is too high level for us right now. First, we need to go to the next zone by level, which is, at the time of recording this video at least, the most recent zone, which is the Yondershire. The Yondershire is level 20 to 23, and it does not have any epic quests involved with it, but it of course has its own storyline quests and all sorts of stuff like that. 
The next zone will be Lowlands, which is level 22 to 32, and I will point out the book quests only go from level 22 to 30. Also, Lowlands has Gartha Garwin, which is actually a non-scalable instance at level 32, so you cannot scale it like a lot of other Eriador instances. And I will point out, even though the zone is 22 to 32, technically some of the Gartha Garwin quests for that 3 and 6 man instance, it's got a few different wings of it, those are level 35 quests, but they all involve level 32 content, just to point out that technicality again, zones are not all that normalized in Lotro. But moving on, the next zone after Lonelands level-wise is actually north of Breelands. This is the North Downs, which is level 24 to 30. All the book quests here, I should point out, are level 30. And then there are actually two instances that are going to be in North Downs. The one is Fornost, which has four different wings of it, and that one unlocks now at level 25 plus. And there's also Enidwaith, which is a later zone. It's actually in Eriador. But when the Enidwaith update was added, they added a lot of instances around Eriador that are in various zones, including some lower level zones like North Downs here. So there's going to be the Stone Height instances technically located in North Downs. And if you're wondering about that, it is a level 65 plus instance. Next zone on the list is going to be Evendim, which is level 30 to 40. It's actually fairly straightforward. And hey, my character's located here. But anyway, this zone has an instance called Enuminos, which is also split into a few wings. Enuminos is level 40 plus. I do want to point out there are technically no epic quests in Evendim that are within the level range of the zone. There are actually some level 50 book quests that you will come back here for at level 50, but there is the Blade That Was Broken storyline, which goes from level 32 to 40 and matches the zone pretty well. But that one you actually have to pick up from Aragorn and Rivendell, so that has quite a few quests in Evendim and it actually has an instance at the end of it if you are interested in that. The final thing for Evendim, there is one of those Enidwaith cluster instances in their absence that is going to be level 65 plus as well, and that one is North Cotton Farms in this area. Zooming back out and now going east, we have the Trollshaws. I know Eriador kind of running around everywhere with the level ranges, but that is the way it is. And the Trollshaws is going to be level 30 to 40. And there is the angle of Mithethel portion you might notice here, but that's 40 to 45 as we'll get to in a moment. The book quests I will point out for Trollshaws are level 37 to 40. So back to Trollshaws for a moment, I did want to point out that the instance here is going to be level 65 plus, and that's one of the in their absence in Edwaith instances, Lost Temple up here. And the book quests for Trollshaws, just to point out, are level 37 to 40, so they match up fairly well with the zone. Now I mentioned the angle of Methethel, that is actually going to be our next zone, even though it's the way it works in the game is kind of technically a subzone of Trollshaws. This one is going to be level 35 to 40, and none of the book quests go here. Moving on from Trollshaws and Rivendell, we can zoom out and go north, not to the Etten Moors, that is the PvP zone, but to Misty Mountains. This zone is level 40 to 45, and of great interest to some people at least, has Goblin Town, which can be a very fun area, I will say. Otherwise, the book quests in Misty Mountains are only level 42 to 43. And next up, we have another level 40 zone. There are a lot of those in Lotro. This one's going to be Angmar. Angmar is level 40 to 50, so it covers that entire 10 level range and has a lot of instances. It has Karn Doom up here, it has Uragarth, it has Barad Gulleran, which is in the east. It also has the Raid, the Rift of Nurzgashu. Raids are nowadays at least 12 mans in Lotro, by the way. And there's an important note with Angmar that Volume 1, Book 6, Chapter 6 is going to be required to pass the Watching Stones. The Watching Stones are located here in Malinhad, somewhere hereabouts where my cursor is. They prevent you from crossing to the east. Technically, you can be ported to the east, but to regularly go there and pass the Watching Stones, you will have to complete that epic quest. And speaking of epic quests, they are level 44 to 50 in Angmar. During the original launch of Lotro, titled Shadows of Angmar, Angmar was the endgame zone basically and contained all the endgame instances, as you may be able to tell, so there is actually a lot of landscape group content if you are interested in that in Angmar. But back out, we will move to the west to go to Forakel, which is a level 44 to 50 zone. All the book quests here are going to be level 50 though. 
Now, Forrick Hell has two instances. One is going to be Agaroth, the Narrow Dell, probably located somewhere hereabouts, but there is no portal to it in the world. This one's going to be level 45 plus. It is a three-man instance, and then after that, there is Seri Surma, which is one of the Inadwaith in their absence on one of the icebergs out here, and that is level 65 plus. As a note, if you're looking to discover Seri Surma so you can run it because you need the discovery deed to run it, you can take a boat from the northwestern end of Surrey Kyla that will just take you right to that to get that discovery if you're interested in that. Again, you have to be level 65 plus for that though. Back out of Forakel, we are going to once again go back to Breland, and as I already hinted at, the Wildwood is going to be a level 45 zone. All the quests here are level 45. If you quest through the zone without any sort of XP disabler, you will of course level up and get plenty of XP from it, so don't worry about having such a limited level range just because all the quests are technically level 45 here. Moving back out, we have covered most of Eriador and most of the low level portions of it at this point. We actually get to go down all the way to Eregion, which is basically the precursor to Moria. Eregion is level 48 to 51, but all the book quests here are level 50. And there's quite a lot going on here. First of all, it has two three man instances it has Ghoul at Than Myrdine and Library at Than Myrdine. And to go along with that, I should point out there are technically a couple level 53 quests, but those level 53 quests are associated with some level 50 and 51 content down here on the south. The quest level just hasn't been updated to match that. And then a big feature of Eregion is Walls of Moria, which is technically inside of Eregion, and any of the stuff you do in the Walls of Moria will count for the Eregion deed. So the Walls of Mori is important because this is where you will acquire your legendary items as we talked about earlier. All of the quests in the Walls of Mori are level 50, meaning that you can actually do them as early as level 45, which is something some people do to get their legendary item really early on. But personally, I honestly recommend just waiting until at least level 46 or just whenever you finally get around to that point in the game. So as the precursor to Moria, after Eregion, we actually have Moria. So this is the entirety of Moria. All of it is in a cave underground, except technically one part, as we'll get to, is outside. And something I should point out at this point is that while Moria as a region covers level 50 to 60, technically the very starter quests inside Moria don't start until level 51, just as a note. A lot of expansions in Lotra, at least some of the older expansions, are like that, where even though they cover a level range where it does start on an even number and round number like that, often the quests to start the expansion are one level higher than that minimum level, so it does work out a little bit odd if you're factoring in like being five levels under that. So that is a note to keep in mind going forward. But yes, Moria is level 50 to 60 content. We have for each of the individual zones, we have the Great Delving, which will be level 51. Silver Teen Loads is 52. Then back up north, Durin's Way is going to be 53 to 54. And this is where the outside part comes in with Zerg Ziggle. If we zoom back out, it's actually at the top right of this map. Zerg Ziggle is basically involved with level 53 content thereabouts. And then the waterworks in the southwest is going to be 54. After that, we have Zelamalek up here, where 21st Hall, the main hub of Moria, is located. Zelamalek is going to be level 55. Redhorn Loads, south of Zelamalek, and I guess technically east, is level 56. And moving on from that, we go to the Flaming Deeps, which is level 57. And then we decide to go back up northeast to Nudmalek, which is going to be level 58. And finally, Foundations of Stone is 59. Now, I personally feel like we've been stuck in this cave a little bit too long, so let's go ahead and go outside to the Demerald Dale. And if I right-click, you will notice we're in an entirely new region. So we are now officially in Rovanian here, and we will start off with Lothorian way down here on the bottom left. Lothorian is going to be level 59 to 60, and it can be an alternative to the high-level areas of Moria, if you wish. To keep spoiler-free, I won't share details about the book quests, but they will all be level 60 when you go start Lothorian here. Now, east of Lothorian, we're going to have Mirkwood. 
And Mirkwood is level 60 to 65 expansion. And as I mentioned earlier, technically the starter quests here are level 61. Also, an important note with Mirkwood is you must complete the intro quest here in the western portion of the zone to be able to advance to the eastern portions of the zone. And unlike an area like Angmar, where I mentioned there was a gate like that, you actually cannot get into Mirkwood basically any way without having completed that as an important note. So if you never do that, you will not be able to enter Mirkwood. And the intro quest will start off somewhere here in Eastern Lothorian, and at the very least, the book quest will definitely get you ready for that. All right, so after Mirkwood, we actually get to go all the way back to Eriador, and this was a zone added after the Mirkwood expansion launch, and during the Mirkwood expansion era, it was Enidoith. And originally, this zone was actually level 65, and it was, or 64 to 65, and it was basically for the level cap. Nowadays, Enidwaith is level 60 to 65 to match Mirkwood, and it's basically an alternative for Mirkwood. Just to point out, all the book quests in Enidwaith will be level 65, and I believe they start and launch. If not, they start way up here in Thor's Kroom at the top of that, essentially. After Enidwaith, and basically why we went to Enidwaith after Mirkwood kind of randomly, is because of Dunlin, which is going to be level 65 to 75 with the Rise of Isengard content. Actually, just a little minor correction, the technical Dunlin part, we have to click it, this one is going to be 65 to 72. And it has a lot of mini areas here which are not technically their own zones. After Dunlin proper, we have the Gap of Rohan, which will be level 73 to 74. And to top it all off at level 75, there's Nan Kurinir, also known as Isengard. And we have to zoom out a few times and we can get to the Great River, which like Enidwaith, here it is in, it's in technically Rohan Northeast. It's really hard to get to with the map. So I will go to Lothorian and then click the Great River here because that's actually how you get to it in game. You would start in Southeastern Lothorian and then go to the Great River and start off at Thinglad. But anyway, like Enidway, the Great River was originally added as a level cap zone during the Rise of Isengard expansion, but nowadays it is level 70 to 75. And yeah, not too much to say about the Great River, so we'll move on to East Rohan, which is going to be a part of the Riders of Rohan expansion, which was level 75 to 85. To cover the zones individually and briefly, we will have the Wold here in the east at level 75 to 76. East Wall down here in the southeast at 76 to 77. Norcroft's in the middle here, 78 to 80. Entwash Vale northwest is going to be 80 to 81. Suckcroft's is 83 to 85 down on the southwest. And then finally, Wildermore, which was added at a later update, is all level 85 content up there. And after Riders of Rohan and East Rohan, we have Helm's Deep with West Rohan, which is level 85 to 95. And kind of similar to East Rohan, each of the little areas is spread in the levels. You will start off here in Kingstead, then you will go to Eastfold and then up to Broadacre, Stone Deeds, Westfold, and then Helm's Deep. And to point out Entwood, like Wildermore is going to be an old level cap zone at level 95. Moving on from that, we have Western Gondor, which is going to be south of Rohan. So I'll click to Gondor there, and we'll start in Western Gondor. This is where you would enter Gondor from the Paths of the Dead. And Western Gondor does consist of three, sort of four zones, depending how you consider it. Blackroot Vale is going to be the start. Then you have Lamadon here, including the town of Calumbel there. And then you'll have the Havens of Belfalus. And just to point out, the Cape of Belfalus here is actually a housing neighborhood. It's a premium housing neighborhood that is located in Western Gondor. Now, what I consider the kind of fourth zone of Western Gondor is actually the Dead Marshes. So the way this works in game is you actually just get ported to it, but it does have a physical location in the game, and it's all the way up here in the northeastern portion of Gondor, right next to the Waste. If we click that one, it's going to take us to the Waste. But if we click the one, gotta go back to Gondor, if we click the one just up and left of that, that one is going to be the Dead Marshes right here, just to point out that it was added with Western Gondor and has Western Gondor content at level 100 with it. Moving on from Western Gondor, which was 95 to 100, we have Central Gondor, which is all level 100, Ringlow Vale, Dor, and Ernil, and then Lower Lebanon is all level 100. 
Similarly, Eastern Gondor is all going to be level 100 with all the zones Upper Lebanon, Lossarnak, and South of Ilion. And can't forget Osgiliath, almost did forget that, that's level 100. And you might notice a theme here, Old Anorian. That is also going to be level 100 in all of its subzones with Talithanor, Pelinor, and Minas Tirith proper. All those are going to be level 100. After Old Anorian, we start Far Anorian, which is up to the north here, kind of far away. It's all going to be level 100 to 104, including the Eastern Zone Tar Druidin, which is level 101 to 102. And then the Beacon Hills here in the west is going to be 103 to 104. And then the Battle of Pelennor Fields is going to be level 105. And of course, after the battle for Pelennor Fields, we will have the after battle version of Pelennor, including the after battle version of Minas Tirith. We will have, yeah, just the after battle version of all this. And this was all released as the March of the King update, which is all level 105 content. Everything you see here, including the Anorian after battle, Osgiliath after battle, and North Athelion. Uh, North Athelion is right up here. That is all level 105, just like the Waste up here as the next update in zone. And the northeastern portion of Gondor right here, technically located in Mortor as we zoom out here, that is also level 105. So we made it through Gondor, made it up to level 105, and that will of course take you through the main portion of the epic quest that covers the Lord of the Rings story. After that, we will start the Black Book of Mordor, which is going to be a new, basically, epic quest series that follows the events of the Lord of the Rings. And that is, of course, going to start with Mordor. It is the Black Book of Mordor, after all. So let's zoom into the Plateau of Gorgoroth, which will be the main region of the Mordor expansion and cover level 105 to 115. Adun is going to be the starter zone up here in the northwest, and then you move down to Doramarth, and then you will have Lingris and Talitharui. Talitharui is a really long stretch of a zone here, and only one stable master way in the northwest, just to point out. And then you will also have Agarnath as the final zone of Mordor. Now, after the Plateau of Gorgoroth and the Mordor expansion, we do not go to the Morgul Vale yet. We actually go, we have to zoom way out and go to Rovanian after that to go to Aaron Laskalin and the Dale Lands, also known as the Strongholds of the North as another name you may see this zone called. A lot of people, I will point out, just simply call it Northern Mirkwood because a lot of the zone really is Northern Mirkwood, but it also contains Dale and Erebor. That is where the name the Strongholds of the North comes from because there's the Stronghold of the Elves right here with Felagoth, Strongholds of Race of Man with Lake Town and Dale, and then there's also Erebor, Stronghold of the Dwarves. I honestly don't even know if the Hobbits have a Stronghold anywhere to consider, really. So anyway, that long explanation of what this zone is even called, it is level 115 is the point and does continue the Black Book of Mordor. And after this update, we had an update that added two zones which continued the Black Book of Mordor. The first was Iron Hills, that is going to be in the far northeast area of Rovanian here. If we go back to Strongholds, we have Iron Hills. Now, Iron Hills is going to be level 115 to 117, and then Irid Mithrin on the west side of the northern Mirkwood zone, that is going to be 117 to 120 to make that entire update with both of those zones, Iron Hills and Irid Mithrin, level 115 to 120, and those are the dwarf holds. After those two zones, we have the Vales of Anduin, which is actually going to be down in the south here. There's Wells of Bling Flood, but then south of that, there's the Vales of Anduin, which does connect in the very far north to northern Mirkwood. That is a connection to it. And it also actually connects to Eregion. You can drop down from Vales of Anduin to Eregion at the Redhorn Pass, but not the other way around. And you can actually connect to the Misty Mountains from either side. So this zone has a lot of connections, and it is all level 120. After the Vales of Anduin, we do continue the Black Book of Mordor, but we continue it actually in Mordor this time, and we still don't quite go to Minas Morgul. The Black Book of Mordor in the Minas Morgul expansion, which is level 120 to 130, actually goes back in time at the Plateau of Gorgoroth and Mordor Besieged. It is the Second Age version of Mordor, and it is currently being besieged, at least at that time. And this zone is level 120 to 122. And if you're wondering how to get to this area Mordor Besieged, 
Well, the Black Book of Mordor will take you here proper and it will port you here. And then after a while, you'll be able to click some tapestries around the main camps and transport between Mordor Besieged. And the next zone, the main chunk of the Minas Morgul expansion, the Morgul Vale. So just briefly back on Mortal Besieged, I do want to point out that I already talked about it being level 120 to 122, but technically it does have some level 130 end game content in it. The Morgul Veil, the main zone of the Menace Morgul expansion, has level 120 to 130 content. And as far as the proper Menace Morgul city goes, it is level 125 to 129. So it does take up a decent chunk of the zone's level range. I will also point out this is going to be the culmination of the Black Book of Mordor, and this is where it will end. But after that, you can start the Legacy of Durn and the Trials of the Dwarves as the next main quest book quest series after the Black Book of Mordor, and that will start at level 130. Now, the first zone associated with it is going to be Walls of Langflood, which is a level 130 zone. But to start the Black Book of Mordor, you actually have to go back to Scarhold and talk to to Durin and Scarhold, and he'll start you on the off legacy of Durin and the Trials of the Dwarves. And again, that will take you to the Wells of Langflood. There are two portions of Wells of Langflood, just to point out. There's the southern portion, which will deal with a lot of Beorning stuff. And then there's the northern portion, where the legacy of Durin will come into play. So don't forget about the southern portion if you're going on the book quest, if the zone interests you. Also, there's a neat little area here in the West, just to point out, since we have a lot of facts about Wells of Blank Flood here. But after Wells of Blank Flood, we go to the north, so I will actually have to zoom back in and go to Elder Slade. Elder Slade is a level 130 zone. It's associated with the War of Three Peaks, which there is actually a War of Three Peaks phase of the zone. But anyway, with the War of Three Peaks mini expansion, that is all level 130 content and continues the legacy of Durin and the Trials of the Dwarves. Now, before we go to Gundabad, we actually have to go to the Tales of Yore as in a bazaar. And the best way I know to go there is show map Tales of Yore at the very bottom. And we have as in a bazaar, which is third age 2799. So this is during the Sixth War of the Dwarves and Orcs, I believe. But the point is, this is all level 130, and it functions like Mordor Besiege, where you actually travel back in time, essentially. At least that's how I will share it without doing any spoilers of the story. But that is that, and it's the old version of the Stimrel Dale Lothorian area, at least the western portion of that. Just to point that out if you did not recognize that. But that's level 30 and the last level 130. That's the last level 130 content we have. And next up we have Gundabad, which here's the Elder Slade area there. But then we have inside Gundabad and outside Gundabad over here. So the Gundabad expansion has a lot of zones and it is the highest level stuff currently in the game. It is level 130 to 140. If we go inside Gundabad, it will start here and continue the legacy of Durin, of course. And it will start in Madagar, then it will go to Deep's Crave, and then after that you'll go to Pit of Stone Jaws, and after that you'll actually go outside to Karbronak. And after Karbronak, you go back inside Gundabad here, and then you will go to Glooming Tarn, then Cloven Gap after Glooming Tarn, and finally Welcome Lofts as the last zone of Gundabad. And there we have it. Those are all the zones of Lotro in their level range. I know I went through this a little bit slow, but if you're interested in a faster version of this where I just say essentially the level range of the zone, I plan to have that either in a previous video or an upcoming video just to point it out. And yeah, that is all of these zones in the game and some important things you may want to do in certain zones. And on the note of important things you might want to do in certain zones, trait points, as mentioned, are quite important. So let's cover more details on those. There are a total right now of 101 trait points in Lotro, but your character can only use 98, meaning there are actually three extra trait points in game that you can skip and still get the maximum for your character. So for the list, you can get 55 total trait points just from leveling up to level 140. Then there are going to be 46 trait points from other sources other than just leveling. So the level 15 and 30 class quests each directly give a trait point to Brawlers and Beornings, and all the other classes these will progress a class deed that will eventually give a trait point. 
So overall, you can get eight trait points from class deeds, which typically involve using a certain skill or a certain type of skill so many times. Then all classes will have three deeds from legendary books starting at level 39. These can be purchased from your class trainer and involve killing mobs in level 40 to 60 zones. Each deed will tell you where the pages can be acquired so you know where to go to get those. Finally, all classes also have a level 45 class quest for a trait point, and they'll have a level 58 class quest for a trait point, and that one will be located in Moria. So really, what matters here are class deeds and class quests and just keeping those in mind as you level. Next up, all classes except the Brawler and Bayorning will get a trait point from completing the Minds of Moria meta deed. This one involves doing all of the Moria book quests, and then the second trait point for Moria is going to be from the Iron Garrison Guards Reputation faction. You must reach Kindred for them, then for a cheap price you can buy a book that grants a single trait point. Adding up all these sources so far, we are up to 70 total trait points from character level up to 140, class deeds and quests, and the Minds of Moria expansion. Next up, there are going to be two regions which have trait points acquired from zone quests. The first that we'll encounter is West Rohan from level 85 to 95, and that has five trait points for completing a quest line associated with each zone within West Rohan. And then similarly, Central Gondor at level 100 has four trait points also for completing each zone's quest line. One more trait point can be earned from a level 100 non-epic book quest series called Ashes and Stars, specifically chapter 4 from that, which is located in Osgiliath in Eastern Gondor. That brings our total trait points up to 80, and next on the list is two more trait points from deeds in the level 100 Old Norian region. The first of these is going to be the quest of Old Norian deed to complete the quest deed in each Old Norian zone. The second is the deeds of Old Norian meta deed to complete all the quests, exploration, and slayer deeds in the Old Norian zones. So yes, this is going to be a deed to complete a bunch of deeds, but one of those deeds also gives you a trait point. And the whole point here is that doing all the deeds in Old Norian will get you two trait points total. Now, a system introduced in Helm's Deep with West Rohan and continued into Gondor is the epic battle system that I talked about earlier. There are two more trait points you can get from earning promotion points in epic battles, which are acquired from getting medals from epic battles and their side missions. For 100 promotion points, you get one trait point, and of course, getting 200 promotion points is how you get the second trait point. As a note, epic battles can be run starting from level 10, but your character will be quite weak to say the least when their level is scaled up. Conversely, if you run these higher than level 95 or 100 and your character scales down, they might actually be a bit strong and epic battles should be easier to complete. And then you might have an easier time getting your promotion points for your clash trait points. So after all of this, we are up to 84 clash trait points. A new way to earn trait points was introduced in Gondor, which is from the epic book quest, starting with volume 4 in Western Gondor. Since level 100 at the end of Western Gondor, there are 17 total trait points spread throughout the book quest, and that will bring our total up to 101. To point out specifically where these come from, there are going to be five total trait points from Volume 4, then there are six trait points from the Black Book of Mordor, which includes level 115 content and some level 120 to 130 content. Next up, there's going to be the Legacy of Durin, which has four total trait points and spans levels 130 to 140. At level 130, the Blood of Azog storyline has a trait point at the end, which is in the Tales of Yor as Anablezar zone. And there should be, if you're curious, an introduction to that at level 130 to get started with it. Finally, the last trait point can be earned from Volume 5 at the end of Book 1. Volume 5, Book 1, is going to be the Great Wedding if you're unfamiliar, and that can actually be run by any character level, I believe 10+, plus. but there's actually no documentation that I can find on the minimum level because it is fairly low in the quest scale tier character's level anyway. If you cannot start the quest there, I recommend going back at a little bit higher level, but at the very least you should be able to run it at level 20. Now to start this, the book quest can be started at Aragorn, <coughs> I mean King Elisir, at the top of the Midsummer version of Minas Tirith in the Tower of Ecthelion.
So that is Clash Trait Points for you. Now for the other progression systems, they are fortunately much more straightforward than that. Legendary items loot will be rewarded from quests starting with the Mines of Moria content and technically some Eregian content as well. On that note, the War Steed and Associated Amount of Combat is a one-time unlock from East Rohan with a level 76 quest. Virtue XP is going to be acquired from deeds such as Advanced Slayer Deeds, Quest Deeds, and Exploration Deeds associated within each zone or region in the game. Typically, my personal strategy with these Virtue XP granting deeds is to play through a zone enough to at least complete the quest deed, then the exploration deed is usually easy to finish up if it didn't actually finish up just from the quest, and that will give me some easy Virtue XP, and I get to take a breath and actually enjoy some sightseeing in Middle Earth. Now, depending on the character and situation, I oddly actually do enjoy Slayer Deeds as well. The potential problem with this strategy is that you will really outpace the zones level by going completionist style. But if you actually pick and choose your zones and start maybe some zones under leveled while perhaps occasionally skipping a zone, that can help this issue and may be a strategy you want to implement on your alts or at least consider it. But on this note of completionist style, that may also help with reputation factions. Reputation is earned from quests, deeds, tasks, and that does include daily and other repeatable quests. And then one more source is occasionally reputation items will drop from mobs and maybe even rewarded from quests. Reputation is going to be a mixed bag in Lotro, with some zones being fairly easy to max out from just questing in a few deeds, but other zones reputation factors require a decent bit of grinding to max out and repeating dailies. If you do all these zones deeds for Virtue XP, that will certainly give you a good head start on reputation as a two for one type situation because you get Virtue XP as well. And it's really actually a three for one if we factor in that deeds give you Lotro points, which leads into our next section. So speaking of Lotro points, now is a great time to talk about their use while leveling. If you are a free to play player and not a VIP subscriber, you will of course have to buy post Helm's Deep content to play through zone quests. You can check out my video here for more information on that. So earning and saving Lotro points that you get from deeds, which of course benefit your Virtue XP reputation and obviously character XP. So basically just playing the game and getting these deeds done, those Lotro points can be used to actually buy quest packs and expansions in the game. If you're wondering the highest value quest packs purely for leveling and progressing your character, you have Central Gondor and Olden Orion, both at level 100, would be at the top for Clash Trade Points, followed by Mordor, which is technically an expansion for levels 105 to 115, then Minas Morgul, which is also an expansion but levels 120 to 130, and after those two, Gundabad for level 130 to the current cap of 140. Although there are some level gaps, notably level 115 to 120 there, these zones along with book quests, which you should have access to all of at that point, and any potential missions you may want to run, those will give you plenty of XP to level up with. So if you're not VIP and looking for a bang for the buck option to get past level 95, that is what I would recommend. Central Gondor, Old Orion, Mordor, Minas Morgul, and Gundabad. Now, before we get into traveling purchases, I should cover inventory purchases. I highly value my inventory slots and they can be quite convenient to have, especially considering that inventory slots will be account wide. I really don't think they are a bad purchase in the game. In the same vein, there are these items called carryalls, which can be very appealing. Carryalls are almost like a second inventory for your character, but they only store specific items such as crafting materials, task items, etc. I find the crafting carryall to be the best one, at least if you do craft on your character or gather like I often do. Now, some other Lotro store purchases you may consider is the Riding Trait, which is about 100 Lotro points for a single character and can be gotten as soon as you are out of the intro. Mounts can also be purchased, but you can often get these easily from festivals or even just a Mount Venter at the Breland Horse Fields for in-game gold. Either way, you will need the Riding Trait in some form to actually be able to ride the mounts that you get. 
There are going to be some other good purchases with Lotro Points or the premium currency Mithril Coins if we haven't talked about enough currencies yet, and these can enhance your experience traveling around Middle Earth. The first thing I would recommend is the Lalia's Market Port for 3 Mithril Coins, which equates to roughly 30 Lotro Points. You can buy large packs of Mithril Coins for Lotro Points. This is a very convenient port near the Boar Fountain in Bree, and if you're a VIP, it takes you very close to the Town Service NPC, which of course gives you the most OP item in the game if you're not familiar, because that lets you use Town Services such as Vault, Shared Storage, and a Vendor, all on the go. Next up, I would suggest looking into a second milestone skill. This would become especially convenient if you're bouncing between locations, or as I have run into recently on my minstrel, wanting to travel in and out of Moria because otherwise that can be a little bit inconvenient. Additionally, you may consider getting the reduced milestones cooldown to be able to use these even more frequently. And if you give SSG enough money, you can just about become a hunter on any class at this rate. But on a more serious note, the last thing I can recommend for traveling is the best thing I have ever purchased from the Lotro store, which is the account-wide journeyman writing. This has two main benefits. The first is that every single character you have made and will make in the future, they get the writing trait from this purchase, which after 30 to 40 characters, that really does add up in value. And the second benefit is actually that all mounts will have the fastest possible speed in the game, which is 70%, whereas mounts typically have 68, 62, and 38% speed. So you can go really fast on some of these slower and sometimes easier to get mounts. Continuing on this note about traveling, but shifting away from the Lotro store, I will say an easy ability to travel can be really helpful to your experience while leveling in Lotro. Aside from the Lotro store purchases we just discussed, there are actually many ways to get permanent skills for your character to travel to main hubs around Middle Earth. The Hobbit, Dwarf, and Race of Man all have travel skills that can be bartered for with appropriate reputation level and currency. These will take you to Mikkel Delving, Thorin's Hall, and Bree, respectively. As a note, if you are the race of one of these, you get a racial trait for that travel skill, so you can't actually get the reputation version. And then if you are an elf, you can get a racial trait to travel to Rivendell, and high elves, that would be Karis Galadon. Static dwarves also have Thorin's Hall just like regular dwarves, while Bayornings will get their own port to Bayorninghus, located in the Vales of Anduin, which has a convenient swift travel to South Bree for Bayornings. Otherwise, that is all that non-warded and hunter classes can get for travel, at least until Mirkwood, which we'll get to in a second. First, Hunters and Wardens can both have ports all around main camps in Middle-earth. Hunter, of course, can port Fellowship members, whereas the Warden cannot, because they are too selfish. But Hunters can also travel to campfires. The benefits of Hunter and Warden are a bit less starting with Mirkwood, where you can actually consistently get a one-hour cooldown for turn to skill for each zone in the game from each reputation faction. These typically require the highest reputation tier, but are often going to be worth picking up if you have the reputation because of the great travel benefits. Fortunately for Hunters and Wardens, their travel skills from these reputation factions are going to be bartered for. They typically have lower reputation requirements and they don't have a cooldown, so they're still benefit. But whether you're a hunter or warden or neither, picking up travel skills from reputation is something to remember as you quest through zones. As we get started with efficient leveling in Lotro, something to keep in mind is that you can, of course, mix and match some of these leveling routes. So to get started with a mind, we'll start in our starter zone, which of course depends on your race and really where you want to go. Again, you can travel to any of them. A lot of my characters, I tend to prefer the elf one just because I like it and going Kellenim and then up north through Ear of the Wind, eventually getting to the Dwarven area. But either way, after you finish your character starter zone, whichever one you want to go through, the Shire, Breland, etc., I typically like to go through Bree and get to Barrow Downs as early as possible because that place is great for efficient leveling with tons of quests and fairly fast pace. It also has the benefit of being great for the Mina Bree reputation faction and giving you enough reputation and reputation items to get your port 
to Bree, which is very convenient to have as one of the mainest main hubs in Lotro. But after Bree land, Lowlands is great because you will be roughly level 20 and Lowlands, as we covered, is technically not exactly 20 at the start, but there's flexibility in when you start it. So roughly level 20 start Lowlands could be a little bit earlier or later, and that gets us set up nicely for Troll Shaws. Now from Troll Shaws, you have a whole bunch of different options, things like Wildwood, Angmar, Misty Mountains, or even the Angle of Mythethel here. You could even do missions. So no matter what you do with the tons and tons and tons of level 40 plus options in Lotro, no matter which of those you end up choosing for your character, which I choose for my character, I like to go to Eregion. And depending on when I want to start that, around level 46 ish would be the earliest for some efficiency. So no matter how we end up to Eregion, that is where I go to my characters to start getting their legendary item and eventually go to Moria. But one thing I do want to go back and point out is Evendim is a great zone for level 30 to 40 if you wish to mix that in somehow compared to these other zones such as Trollshaws, which is technically 35 to 40. So you might be a little bit low level for Trollshaws and might prefer Evendim for your 30 to 40 experience on your character. So I did just want to point that out. But going back to Eregion and going through through Moria. Moria is generally reserved for level 50 plus for me and optionally I can either continue going through Moria all the way to like level 60 or something but can start Lothorian as early as about 56 on some characters if I really want to get out of that cave. Now for Mirkwood or Inadwaith after that both are great options in my personal experience I tend to prefer Inadwaith and find myself running that more frequently just because I typically find it to be faster paced and more fun for me personally but Really, either of those does work. Now, for level 65 to 75, of course, Dunland can cover all that, Dunland, Gap of Rohan, and Isengard, but you can do the Great River, and maybe you want to run after Enidwaith or Mirkwood or whatever. You could run a few missions and go all the way to Great River. It does take a second to get to that on the map. And that would set you up either of those options at level 75. That would set you up for East Rohan. And then after East Rohan, of course, there is West Rohan. Now, West Rohan is really important to make sure you basically do every single quest. There are a couple sides quests that you can skip, but you have to do basically all of them to make sure you advance all the quest lines to actually get your five trait points there. Now, Western Gondor is actually fairly skippable. I don't always necessarily recommend skipping it, but this is my efficient leveling route where I actually skip most of Western Gondor and I just keep up with Volume 4 because all of the trait points spread throughout it. And that does actually apply throughout all of Gondor because there are a bunch of trait points spread throughout the entirety of Volume 4 until like the Black Book of Mordor intro. Now following Western Gondor, I like to do Central Gondor because that also has some class trait points associated with it. Even if I'm below level 100, I think that is a great efficient area to go through next. After that, we have Osgiliath and Ashes and Stars as relatively easy and quick to get a trait point and some extra XP. And then if you need extra XP in Oskilia, that is a great place for some extra side quests. Now, Old Anorian. This one's going to be a little bit tough. Let's actually get to it on the map here. And the benefit of Old Anorian is, of course, two trait points from the meta deeds. But if you skip the Moria deed trait point, then skipping two more would still get you the maximum usable trait points because you can skip a total of three. So in my experience, it is most efficient to either skip the Old Anorian trait point or the Epic Battles promotion trait points. If you want to run the Epic Battles, you might actually consider skipping out on a lot of Old Anorian. Um, if you want to do that, by all means do so, because you will still get the two trait points if you do the Epic Battles option. But otherwise, if you don't do the Epic Battles, you might want to consider doing all of Old Anorian for those trait points. Either way, it is going to be most efficient to just continue the book quest until you start the Black Book of Mordor in Mordor. Now, if you're really looking for the most efficient leveling from here, I just follow book quests with the Black Book of Mordor and actually skip out on a lot of side quests. Now, if I am interested in character XP, I will do side quests, maybe do side quests in a specific zone such as Talithirui, enough to get the deeds done for some virtue XP, but I might also fill in with like missions, festivals, and dungeons at this point 
And really with that, I think this starts to come down more so to personal preference. If you want to play through everything, of course, that's great. But focusing on efficiency, I personally find a Dune to be my least favorite zone in Mordor. So as I just highlighted, I prefer to do Talitha Rui as basically the only zone I quest through the entirety of in Mordor on an efficient leveling route and otherwise just do the Black Book of Mordor quest. And again, always keep in mind that you have missions, skirmishes, dungeons, and festivals if you want to bit of XP without doing Mordor zone quests and the supplies to future places as well. Again, I do recommend following the Black Book of Mordor the entire time for your clash trait points as there aren't really any on ramps in Mordor and eventually there are level 115 quests with that. So following the Black Book of Mordor, that'll take you to Northern Mirkwood. Again, optional to quest through the zone, but focusing on the Black Book of Mordor. Same with 115 to 120 with the Iron Hills and Arid Mithrin. Optionally do side quests if you're interested in that, but otherwise can, if you're frisky, you can skip straight to Vales of Anduin even around level 115 because that's that will have the Black Book of Mordor and the prelude to what is ultimately going to be Minas Morgul content with the Black Book of Mordor, the prelude shades to the swamp that is. So for levels 120 to 130, that is the Minas Morgul expansion and again, side quests if you want. Personally, for me, my efficient leveling would be to continue the Black Book of Mordor and do a lot of quests inside the city of Minas Morgul just because I find that fun and a lot of dense mobs and dense quests for some great character XP. Now there is an interesting path you can take with the Minas Morgul content in the Black Book of Mortar, which is to get about level 125 when you finish your Minas Morgul content and the book quest, because there are as tons and tons of level 130 content as we covered, and all of that can be started as early as level 125. So if I go to it on the map here, we have Wells of Langflood as the first piece, and that does include some the Legacy of Dirt book quests, which are also going to be valuable. So maybe after getting level 126, so I'm not quite five levels below the content, I start the Legacy of Durin from Durin and Scarhold and Arid Mithrin, that would be to the northeast here. And then I basically just follow that and I have a lot of options for content that could get me to 130, but if I'm feeling really crazy, I could actually start Gundabad below level 130. Something to consider at this point is with the tons of level 130 content options and really depending on what you want to do with your character, you can pick and choose. But some of the higher end level 130 content such as Elder Slate and War of Three Peaks may be extra tough due to crazy stat scaling at that level, especially if you start it under level. But if you're interested in seeing how this works out, I did a little bit of it on my Warden in some somewhat recent live streams the past few months. Now for levels 130 to 140, that returns to the normal expansion method that we had in like the Mordor expansion and Minas Morgul, where the main focus for me with efficient leveling is on book quests and then doing side quests that are of interest to me. But typically with that, I just do most of the quests and the because it's the latest expansion, I typically still do the most quests. But really, Gundabad is yours to do whatever you wish with. Congratulations on reaching the level cap! By the time you've gotten this far into the video, that may actually already be level 150. And as a final reminder, you can level how you want in Lotra. The point of this section was to point out some efficiencies and basically what is safe to skip and what you don't want to skip for character progression. Of course, you can always ignore all that and level however you want. It seems that most players in Lotro tend to prefer the more thoroughly questing through the game and enjoy that experience. And personally, I often do go with that playstyle as well, but because I play many alts, I like to mix and match which character goes through which zone. For example, in Eriador, that has tons of leveling options, and one character might do North Downs while another does Lonelands. One might do Forkel while the other does Ingmar, and yet another does Wildwood, and then even another does Misty Mountains and visits Goblin Town. Some of those may follow up with a Regian, while others may go straight for the Allies. Some may run Moria or essentially skip it with missions and just staying in Eregian extra long. One might even go straight from Eregian plus missions to Inadoith. One character, such as my current minstrel, would do Rise of Isengard content with Dunland, while my guardian recently did Great River and completely skipped Dunland and the regular Rise of Isengard expansion content. 
Usually I tend to start skipping East Rohan after I get my war steed and I just like run missions, skirmishes, and instances to be honest at that point. And then I will usually stop actually playing characters around there because I don't like West Rohan and it feels a little bit too required to me just for the trait points. But ignoring that or for characters that actually do get past that, I run through all of the book quests starting with volume four on every character and basically just follow the same efficient leveling path from there that we just discussed because there's there's not as many alternatives in. There's a lot more very important character progression content at that point and moving forward. An important part of your leveling experience is going to be getting gear to improve your character stats. In Lotro, generally questing gear and random drops from mobs is solid enough, especially considering how like relatively easy landscape content is. That said, many players, myself included in this group, like to make our characters as well equipped as possible. Something to keep in mind though is that you can outlevel gear pretty quick, so spending an immense amount of time and energy and resources for a gear set may not be worth it while leveling. I usually find that crafting sets for like every 10 or so levels up to 50 level 50 and below can be a great value. Additionally, if I have the resources and crafting guild ranked up enough, I may craft some of these sets above level 50, but rarely craft armor and jewelry above level 100. Usually equipment related crafting at that point for me is going to be class items and consumables. Because I play a lot of alts and have a lot of resources, I will also look for old dungeon and raid sets that can be fairly easily bartered for nowadays if I am looking for an upgrade. Often at high levels, I just use quest gear, but if I can find a group to run instances relevant to the zones I'm questing through, these instances often offer gear that is better than quest gear. And finally, if I get enough reputation in the zone, I will always make sure I at least take a look at the rep vendor and occasionally they will have good gear sets that are maybe like relatively easy to barter for and can give me nice upgrades and set me up for the next zone pretty well. Starting in Mordor at level 105, dungeons will reward modes of enchantment, and some instances and quest gear will disenchant into modes of enchantment. Additionally, I talked about earlier some missions will reward modes of enchantment directly, and modes of enchantment, also as I brought up earlier, are a premium currency that you can use to barter for boxes that contain gear that will scale to your character's level. These can be decent options if you're really needing an upgrade for a certain slot. Common pieces that I will personally use modes of enchantment for include pocket item, shield, offhand weapon, and generic ranged weapon for melee classes. As a reminder, modes of enchantment are only useful for leveling gear or swapping the currency for the cosmetics premium currency called Figments of Splendor. So just keep in mind that you may not get any use out of the motes of enchantment after getting to the current level cap area with Gundabad, and don't let your motes go to waste with the cap and really consider maybe turning them into figments for cosmetics. For some other gearing options outside of crafting and moats, to upgrade from the baseline questing gear, the skirmish camp offers some somewhat decent pieces, in particular for levels below 100. Starting at level 50, the skirmish camp also offers some old dungeons and raid sets, which can be good upgrades at old level caps. These all cost marks and medallions, which may be a pit duff to get on your first character going through these levels. Marks and medallions are going to be rewarded in small quantities for deeds, very small quantities really, but they are primarily gotten through dungeons and skirmishes. Larger group sizes, higher difficulties, and higher levels for instances give more marks and medallions. On the note of marks and medallions though, some of the main hubs of old level caps also have barter vendors which can offer pretty good gear. Notably, Galtrav at level 75 has some pretty nice pieces. Old level caps do offer gear outside of marks and medallions though, but those are more likely going to be a bit of a grind to get than most players would wish to partake in just for gear that you would rapidly replace while leveling. I have mentioned that I will also use instance gear if I can find groups to actually run instances. For instances below level 100, as in before Gondor, the scaling system offers decent gear, but often there are better options such as the classic dungeon and raid sets or even crafted gear or reputation gear. 
Starting with Gondor and coincidentally the Essence system, instances will start to have better gear, but that especially becomes true with the modern loot system started in Mordor. From Mordor onward, instances typically have great gear corresponding with the level cap during which the instance was released. And now that I have discussed gear here, perhaps a better way to highlight what gear I use besides these just like clips showing pieces you may have no idea about, let's actually explore a couple characters that I have in game and just what gear they use. So as I highlight my gear in game here, I will close my messy inventory and we will just look at this character's gear. He is going to be a low level character. I'll have a medium and a high level character coming up, but just to see what gear I actually have on my character. Let's start with the armor, which I have a crafted helmet, I have crafted shoulder pads. I do have a, an XP boosting back item. I believe you can still purchase this in the Lotro store, but I got it way back in the day from pre-ordering an expansion. Those are nice because their stats scale with your character's level and you, even if you don't want the XP boost, it really helps just to not have to worry about that armor slot. But back to the regular armor, I have a chest piece that is crafted, crafted, Crafted and crafted. I've talked about crafted gear being good and now you get to see it. I am a level 40 burglar and I'm still wearing level 30 crafted armor. And this becomes extra interesting when we look at my jewelry. This is going to be an instance piece of jewelry, level 37. Just to note, I do have one of those scaling earrings to help with XP. I believe that one was from the Mordor expansion. And then for the necklace, this one's actually outdated, but it is level 15. I think it's a random mob drop. And then we have another instance piece of armor, level 37 for jewelry. This one uh, could be a random drop. I actually don't recognize this. It could also be a quest reward, but that's not likely. So that is the second bracelet there. And then I have for a ring, I do have a crafted ring, but then I also have an instance ring for my second ring. And my pocket item is a scaling one that doesn't actually scale well, but it gives extra XP up until level 65. So what is interesting about my jewelry and my armor is that I have a lot of instance jewelry. So I have run a lot of instances on this character, yet the crafted armor is better. So I thought this was a good highlight just to show that Armor wise, not necessarily jewelry wise, armor wise, crafted armor really is good. And level 30 crafted armor, I find better than even level high 30s instance gear that I have gotten. Now, as you might notice, instance drops for jewelry are often quite good because the crafted options usually aren't quite as good compared to the instance ones for jewelry. Now, as far as weapons go, I believe I am running some old quest weapons actually on this character. These are item level 40, and I think I got them from the Fornos quest. They are really nice weapons for one-handed weapons. If you have a character going through that range, you can run as little as level 25 if you can find a group for the Fornos instance. So those are really nice weapons at that point, and I'm still using them at level 40. By the way, as a random tip, if you're wondering why I had all these little things on my user interface, that's because I left up the control backslash menu that lets you move all that stuff. So you press control backslash and that'll let you bring that up. Anyway, let's move to the next character. All right, on to my second character here, and he is the closest I had to mid-level. He is level 103, just to point out. And to look at his armor, I actually have a mix of crafted armor, it looks like, or mostly crafted armor. I'm in a little bit of a weird situation where all my regular armor is level 95 crafted armor, despite my level being level 103. And that's actually a good point just to randomly highlight level 95 crafted armor. It's really good. I had a kinmate craft it for me on this character before I had the recipes, but I do have level 85 random drop pants. These can drop from basically anything. So occasionally you can get these teal set random drops that can be really good for certain level ranges due to the way the stats are distributed. And like my burglar, I have that same back item and I also have some scaling earrings. Now, as far as my other jewelry goes, this is where some other things step in with Epic Battles. I've talked a little bit about Epic Battles gear and in particular, the jewelry from it can be nice. So that is all I have on this character. It's all Epic Battles jewelry to go along with all crafted armor, or at least mostly crafted armor, it looks like. Now for my weapons, I have legendary items. Technically, these are with the old legendary item system. So if you're starting out, you will never see this, but this character hasn't actually upgraded because it's been a while since I've played him. And then for my range slot, that is going to be a Runekeeper class item, and that is a chisel that I have also going to be crafted. 
For my final character, I have my Warden, who is leveling through the Menace Morgul expansion, so she is level 125, and let's check out her armor. I have quest armor for my helmet, it looks like I also have quest armor for my shoulder pads. I also have quest armor for my cloak, you can see as a leveling character who's not at a level cap or not really associated recently with a level cap for an expansion, I do have a lot of questing stuff, this is also going to be from questing. Same with those gloves. Now the pants are actually from the old level cap. This is on a door, so the level cap was actually level 120 for a while. And this, these are pants from one of the six-man dungeons during that. They're one of the better pants that you could get at the level 120 cap. So I still do have those, haven't replaced them, and same with the boots. Those are from the raid. So I have a couple old pieces of dungeon and raid gear. But I've mostly replaced that already, only level 125, and mostly replaced that with quest gear at this point, even yellow quest gear over some teal pieces. For jewelry, I do have a couple of the scaling earrings, not too much interesting there. For her, it looks like my necklace is old dungeon slash raid. My ring is going to be questing. My bracelet is going to be old dungeon slash raid as well. And then my ring, I believe, yep, old dungeon. And then my next ring is actually going to be from, I think that's from an instant drop, actually. I did run some of the leveling instances in Minas Morgul and got that ring drop for level 125. And finally, my pocket item is from questing. So this character finally has a little bit more mixed and actually no crafted pieces of those main pieces there. So a little bit of a change just to show that instance gear can be good. But at this point, I really just rock quest gear until I actually get to the level cap and run dungeons, which this character has not done yet. As far as the other items, we actually do have one crafted that's going to be a class item. I've talked a lot about uh, class items are often the ones that are crafted at high levels so that's what that is for my weapon both javelin and spear actually have the new ally system legendary items and my shield is going to be from a uh, modes of enchantment box that i bartered so yeah this character at least has a little bit more variety and i just really hope this live showcase of the gear that my characters use is helpful just to see what pieces could be good everybody's favorite part of playing a game is doing chores right well, if you ever watch any of my live streams, you will likely see some very messy inventories and full storages. That is because there are tons of items in Lotro. Not all of them are useful, unfortunately, but I personally am a bit of a hoarder when it comes to in-game resources. There are tons of crafting items that you will loot, and each of the crafting items is duplicated for each crafting tier, which covers a certain level range. So as you level up, you will accumulate tons of crafting materials, even if you have no crafting vocation and just don't craft on your character. If you don't want your crafting items, you could consider trying to sell them on the auction house. Sometimes raw materials can actually be worth a relatively large amount of gold. If you really don't want to deal with them though, there is going to be no harm in selling them to a vendor. Additionally, you will loot a lot of trophies and task items, both very visually similar, like white quality items. Trophies are Lotro's version of vendor trash and are 100% safe to sell. Task items are turned in for reputation. I have talked a little bit about tasks throughout this guide, but for anyone unfamiliar, tasks are a set of repeatable quests that you get from a task board. Task boards are associated with a certain reputation faction in the game, and tasks will give reputation for the faction a bit of XP. Task items can be worth saving for task turn-ins. However, in my experience, if you save all of them, that can quickly clutter your inventory. Usually, I personally just end up selling most of them and keep at most maybe one stack for the zone I am currently leveling. Additionally, selling them gives you a decent bit of gold if that is of interest to you. And next up, item-wise, consumables such as morale and power potions and even debuff removal potions, those are all only really relevant for their level and a bit above. I personally find I tend to hoard these a little too much and I recommend using them whenever you need to. For ones below level 105, you can get them cheaply at a skirmish camp for marks if you ever run out as well. 
Now, outside of gear and cosmetics and the things like that, you might run into other items such as premium boosts or tomes that give your character stats such as plus 5% attack damage. They give you some, there are some defense ones, some morale ones, and things like that. Usually these premium boosts are worth saving and just using them when you really need them, whether that's for group content or maybe soloing something a little bit difficult while you are leveling. And just like with the gearing section, let's go ahead and take a look at one of my characters to see what item management is like and an actual look at items in the game that you will acquire from leveling. For the live session of inventory management, I thought the best character to show this on would be the one that I have been leveling lately, which is my minstrel. He has a lot of different things going on in his inventory. The first is going to be some heritage runes, which are for a higher level than he is, so he cannot use those yet. And there we go, I fixed the location of the tooltips, but yes, he cannot use those yet, and therefore the legendary item system. Because he's a minstrel, I do carry around some instruments, so that's what the next few items are. I also have, it looks like, a purchase from store, it says. I do not buy these from a store as the note. There are weekly coupons in the Lotro store to get free stuff, and that must be where this came from, but just keep that in my inventory, would probably put it in my shared storage. And then we have a cosmetic item that would also go in my shared storage or my vault. If I open my vault here and look at that, I could put stuff in it if I'd like. I have spaces for that. Now, how I got to this while I'm on the go is if you are a VIP, you can use the town services. Talk to the NPC, as we mentioned, and get that. So could do that. Have some Virtue XP tomes, and you might be wondering why I'm not using these consumables. I am saving them for when we get a plus percent Virtue XP weekend to just stock up on all of them. So I'll probably send all these at some point to an alt. So that's what those items are. I have some premium stuff that I'd save only for when I really need it. Like if I run something that gives a lot of marks, maybe I would use that for that. Cannot use this run speed boost in combat, but that's what that is. It's a consumable, have some XP boosters, have a bunch of small reputation acceleration tomes on this character. And then this is where we get to the more interesting stuff that you would acquire while leveling. We have these trophies. Trophies generally can be sold, but these ones are special task item trophies that it says can be turned in for tasks in for Kel and Aragian. That's not too relevant to this character. But I can note that and go to task boards in those areas to see if I could turn them in. And these trophies, the broken metal clubs way over here, those are just vendor junk. So just sell them to a vendor. Same with the gorgeous ears there, gorgeous furs, gorgeous sword sheaths. All those are just trophies. Next up, I do have an armor piece. That is probably one that I would sell. Typically, I don't save armor unless it's like a particularly good looking piece for higher level. This is anniversary gift box. Don't really need to worry about that. This is a skirmish intro I haven't done on this character yet. I have some enhancement rune boxes for level 50. There's not much reason to not open those because they're level locked at level 50. They don't scale with my level. Otherwise, I would consider saving them. Universal Solvent is very much so a worthy item at the very least to sell in the auction house because they are used in crafting essences, which you can slot into armor. Have this level 60 piece of jewelry I probably don't need, would sell that. Scroll cases for crafting, if you want to keep these, you can, but I would actually nowadays sell them. I used to hoard them too much. Now that we have dealt with the Rude Wolf, we can look at the Runestone. Wouldn't use that and would just sell that. We have more of the Virtue XP things. And then I have a bunch of old armor that I really just need to sell at the vendor. I lock this particular piece of armor because I can disenchant it into modes of enchantment. So saving that so I can do that. Level 61 armor I don't want to keep. And same with these shoes. I would probably sell them. I have that can give me a title, so might as well use it, get it out of my inventory. The Brawler Battle Gauntlets, these are from the Gundabad expansion, but really what they do is give me some greater morale potions. I would save these ones because they scale. It's a percent of max morale they scale, so I'd save those for when I really need that extra health. These infused adamants, it doesn't really have a great description, but these are used for daily repeatable quests associated with the Moria expansion. Flame of Encalamir is used to disenchant armor. I mentioned these could be disenchanted into modes of enchantment. That's how you disenchant it. You would right click your flame and then you would left click the piece of armor and you can also do that to traceries.
I do have some reputation items from Moria, but I actually did not complete the proper quest to get those because I skipped basically halfway into Moria once I started. Moria was a little bit weird. I have this weapon locked because I'm saving it for cosmetic purposes. A lot of nice cosmetics in Moria, at least in my opinion. Same with that javelin there. And then I have some other pieces of armor that I need to sell, earring that I'm not worried about. Essence Reclamation School to remove essences. Those are the items you can slot in some higher level gear pieces, especially the system comes into play mainly at level 100. So that could remove those for me. And then I have, this can be bartered for a tracery. It's a legendary item item. I have a map to hobnanigans. Could sell that if I don't want it. Otherwise, just leave it in my inventory. And here I have a whole bunch of crafting items. These have the green border in the background, and I tend to save those. You will get a lot of them, as I've mentioned. But I tend to hoard them, and at the very least, I can pass them off to somebody that could actually make use of them in my kinship. So that's that whole row there. Then I have potions. The gray bordered ones are going to be more premium potions, which I tend to save until I absolutely feel like I need to use them. And then next up, I have regular potions. I actually have a little bit too much because I have level 45 potions, which I want to use. Then I have these level 51 potions, but I have level 58 potions. So I should honestly probably unlock and sell all the low level potions because they'll just be crowding up my inventory. And I can focus on using these new potions over here. And then similarly, I have consumables. I have level 40 vitality food that's getting a little bit outdated and not as useful for me at this point. So should make sure I get those consumed up. And then the gray bordered ones are Dale Man's Creams, which I would save those if I really need some extra regen and saving level 60 potions. I'm almost there on this character. And then I have legendary item stuff. I have some enhancement runes that I can't quite use yet because I'm not high enough level with my legendary item. And then tracery, I am saving for when I unlock more slots. And finally, more enhancement runes. And then I have some essences. Essences aren't really worth keeping below level 100 in my experience, and I just get rid of them if they are below level 100, so I'd sell those to the vendor. So yeah, that is this character's inventory. I don't know if it's helpful to act for me to actually go through my inventory and the items I have in my inventory and what I would do with them, but hopefully it is helpful for you to actually see that in game on a real character that I've been leveling and did no preparation for this on. If you made it this far into the video, congratulations, you made it to the last section. Leveling is one of my favorite things to do in not only Lotro, but pretty much any MMO that I have ever played. While not always true, I nowadays try to maximize my fun while leveling, and I like to live in the moment rather than constantly worrying about like my character's level number and just getting that up. With the help of this guide, I hope you enjoy leveling in Lotro just as much as I do. And that closes out the ultimate Lotro leveling and beginner's guide. This video has been a lot of work, so if it helped you, I would appreciate it if you give the video a like and especially share it with someone that may find it useful. I also encourage you to check out all of the referenced guides as well. If you're looking for more Lotro content and guides, please consider subscribing for more and also becoming a channel member to support the content. And finally, thanks for watching everyone.